do you say is the importance of listening to students talk about familiar topics such as public and really trying to integrate that into the class for literacy? Mm -hmm. um, language even. Okay, so one of the things that we really believe in Alpine School District is that language, um, your, your spoken language is the pattern that you use to help you look at written language. Mm -hmm. Um, and whenever we divorce those two pieces apart, we give children only half of the process to work with. So um, when, when I'm picking books for children, I really have to look carefully at what is going to be known information for them mm -hmm. so that they can use that information to predict what's coming in the book. Mm -hmm. um, if, I, if I take away the oral language part and their known experiences, um, I've, I've in some ways handicapped their processing. I've made it harder. I've made it a harder task for them. But what I've also done is I have divided the reading process. They no longer access the whole reading process, so they can't integrate the skills. So I'm teaching the skills in isolation, and they aren't transferring over to a full process. It doesn't make sense. I don't have time to teach everything twice. So no I need to keep it together. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. And how do you, so for example, for ELL students, how do you learn about, I guess, their home life or what they already know, or children who come in from other countries? and Speak a different language, their cultures are totally different. How do you then integrate um, topics that are familiar? Yeah, you start with common experiences. Mm -hmm. And so for a lot of children, that means you start with um, having a meal oh. and looking at some of those things. Like we, we all sit down with our families and eat. We all have parties for our birthdays. Mm -hmm. We all celebrate weddings in some way. So you start with things that you think are going to be common experiences, and then you talk about everyone's experiences with them. Mm -hmm. Because even being from Colorado, what I know of weddings is very different than what people in Utah do for weddings, you know? And so, but it's a common experience that we can all talk about. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing with ELL students. So you look first for those common experiences. They know what the animals are in their own language. Mm -hmm. You know, there are things that, even though they don't have the English word for it yet, mm -hmm. they have the concept development already there. Mm -hmm. So it makes sense to start with things that are more common. If you try to start with things like science and social studies where they don't have a concept development yet, you're teaching both. Mm -hmm. And again, we've made it a harder task. And more in isolation again. Exactly. They're again. going out of their comfort zone completely and being like, well, I don't know. And, then, and they can't put any of the pieces mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. So we start out first with things they know, and we put the reading and the writing together. And I know some people think, oh, you just do the speaking first. Mm -hmm. No, you do it all. Okay. You speak about it, mm -hmm. and then you write it and then they read it. Mm -hmm. And it all comes from that same experience. And if you look it up, it's just called language experience approach. Mm -hmm. And everything else that you do in ELL, all the strategies that you have for ELL students can be mapped in to a, to a language approach. Okay. And I love how you were talking about there's basically three kinds of assessment. Because you talk about it, and you're assessing it, and you're writing it, and you're assessing it again, and then you read it again. And that way they're explaining to other people, this is what I know, this is how I can explain it. Right, and there's one piece of the language experience approach that we don't do. Um, maybe some teachers do, but we don't generally ask them to do it. Mm -hmm. And that is language experience approach says put it in the child's own language. But we believe that language is tutorial in and of itself. Mm -hmm. So if I'm reading a text, it will tutor the child for what that language structure should sound like. Mm -hmm. And that's from Marie Clay. Is it, it, when you're working with ELL students or even children that are just language delayed, mm -hmm. um, the, the, the text will have a tutorial effect on the child. Because mm -hmm. if you constantly try to go back to their native or more regular pace, then they won't ever be able to step up to that next level. Right. And, yeah. and if I'm working with a little group of kids, let's say I've got four kids sitting at my table, mm -hmm. they all speak different languages. Mm -hmm. Which language am I going to put it in for the children? Which one do you choose? Yeah, I'm not, but I'm a member of that group, and so I can help scaffold the language for the children. And mm -hmm. so we put it all in English, and we teach them the structures that they'll need. Mm -hmm. That is wonderful to be able to accommodate, but then push them as well mm -hmm. to reach that end point. Um, so how, let's see. So in one of these, it says encourages students to use the first and second language in instructional activities, and we're talking about how you try not to um, put it so much in every different language that they have, or the slower pace. Well, but that's for a small group instruction. Mm -hmm. So what, would you ever try to incorporate the second language? Mm -hmm. So when would Yeah, you so that? anytime the children are working independently, mm -hmm. they need to use whatever they can get. Okay. Like whatever mm -hmm. word that they need to put <laughs> yeah. in this yeah. story, put that word in the story, and we'll figure it out later. But I just want them to keep the process going. Mm -hmm. I want them to continue constructing their story. Okay. I want them to go for meaning first. Mm -hmm. Do as much as you can in what you know of English mm -hmm. and then do the rest 
in whatever word you can get on the paper. Mm -hmm. For sure, because it's getting to the think through the process rather than being like, I can make sure I get every single word right. Because I remember one of my classes, they, they said focus on meaning or focus on the purpose of what you're yes. doing rather than the nitty gritty details that mm -hmm. they just get so caught up in and then they get so frustrated because they feel like they're failing. And we're always modeling for the kids. So um, I was teaching first grade at a school here in Alpine District that is about half ESL. Mm -hmm. And my class was a little bit higher than that. It was a first grade classroom. And um, one of the places where I taught a lot of the language structures was in a read aloud. And so I would do a read aloud and then I'd have the kids turn and talk to each other and, you know, about something about the book. And then they'd have to raise their hands and talk to me about it. Mm -hmm. So I got to one point in the book and it was about two little girls in the mountain and one girl could read and the other girl couldn't. Mm -hmm. And um, I turned, I turned to the children and I said, think about what you think the little girls are going to do. What are they going to do next now that they know this? So they're all talking and buzzing, and one little girl was just jumping off the floor, wanting me to call on her. And she was one of my ESL students. And she said, and I called her, and I said, okay, so what do you think is going to happen? And she said, she's going to make her to read. And I turned to the class, and I said, what do you think? Do you really think she's going to teach her to read? And so I said, turn and talk to your neighbor and see what you think. So I didn't turn to the child and say, we use the word teach. Mm -hmm. You know, because that's so demeaning. How would you like that? Children feel the same way we do. But instead, we just couch it in the lesson. Keep her enthusiasm, turn to the rest of the class and say, what do you think? Is she right? Is she going to teach her to read? And then everyone heard the word that was different than what she had said. She heard it and probably turned to her friend and then used that mm -hmm. word next. So and the fact that you understood what she was talking about, I think that's what... Sometimes it's forgotten that we actually understand, and it's okay to then kind of interpret it or yes. you know, make it a different meaning or a different word to the rest of the class yeah. because it is all the same. The yeah. purpose is still there. And if you go back to what Brian Kembrough did with the conditions of learning, they are all present at every age of our lives. It isn't just when children are learning as a baby. We do the same thing for the rest of our lives. Mm -hmm. We approximate. I mean, there are, we try things out. We get, we get corrections. We have to have an environment that's conducive exactly. to it. Every one of his conditions still apply, it's no like matter whatever condition. grade level. <laughs> it's used all the time. It's, mm -hmm. And we need that all the time because so many times I can't figure out which word I need to use. Yeah. I use a makeshift word, but we don't ever you know, degrade ourselves for that. So mm -hmm. we should never do for kids, which I think is a great example. Thank you. All right, so just one final um, question. And how do you provide um, opportunities for children to interact with each other and the teacher? while using their language. So one example you used was the reading and, you know, hearing it and then writing it down and talking about it. What are other, I guess, strategies you could use? Or so lots of rehearsal. Okay. And, and then also always pulling them just like, almost like it's a gradient mm -hmm. and you're just pulling them a little bit higher. You're not going to correct everything they have. Mm -hmm. but you're just going to give them something more to think about. So just thinking about, okay, which, which one of those words shall I help them pull a little bit higher? Okay. So that's one thing in every conversation that I have with students, that's what I'm always thinking about. How can I help develop the language a little bit more? Mm -hmm. And it might be vocabulary, mm -hmm. or it might be sentence um, syntax. Okay. So it depends, and I'm not gonna attack both of them at the same time, yeah. it's just too much, it's overload for kids. So think about which one, in whichever situation you're doing, needs to be helped. So first is in conversations, and it's all day, every day. Um, another one in reading that I did is when I would meet with my small groups, um, at the end of small group lesson, I would send everyone away and keep one child beside me, and then we would keep the book, and we would go page by page through the book, and they would tell me about it. And at the very beginning, when they had no, no English language at all, they would kind of like just point at something. And it was almost like, you know, having you have a toddler on your lap and you're reading with them, it was kind of like that. They'd point at something, and I'd say, you're right, that's the mom, that's our main character. Yeah, they'd turn the page. And they point at something else. And then I would give them a full sentence that tells them about that. Oh, yeah, she's vacuuming the floor. We turn the page. So they were hearing me say it, but we were interacting because they were directing what was happening. Mm -hmm. And I'm filling in whatever they can't do. Okay. So kind of the rule is every lesson is successful. You never leave a child to not be successful in a lesson unless it's a test. But we should have very few of those. Yeah. So everything, everything a child does should be successful all the time. Mm -hmm. So if they do this much, I do this much. Mm -hmm. If they do this much, I do this much. Mm -hmm. If they do this much, I do this much. And then it and then it gets smaller until I'm doing very little and they're doing a lot. Mm -hmm. So if you keep that in mind in every lesson that you're doing, the children will be more successful. Mm -hmm. They'll learn faster. They'll be able to integrate that new knowledge into old knowledge. There's so in the book. Whatever they could do, I accepted. Mm -hmm. And I did whatever the rest demanded. 
So if I wanted a full retelling of a book and all they could do is point, I said all the words. Then later on, a month or two later, they're starting to say the names of things or they're, you know, they're naming the cat or whatever. And then I give a full sentence for it. Pretty soon they're giving a little sentence or a phrase and I fill in the rest until it gets to the point where they just say the whole book. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they read, well, not or even read it, they just, just retell the story. whole thing. Mm -hmm. So in every lesson, that's what you do. Mm -hmm. Every lesson is 100% successful, and it's because we're a partnership doing it. And, and they will learn from that partnership. It's like anything that I've learned, I usually find someone who knows how to do it, and they help me through it. Mm -hmm. And whatever I can't do, they do, and I watch them. We do the same thing with children. It's exactly the same thing. And with repetitions. Mm -hmm. So the same thing in writing. So um, the child, if they, all they can do is make little squiggles, mm -hmm. then I turn them into a sentence at the bottom of the page. Mm -hmm. um, and, then I'll, I'll, and then as it moves on, they'll get random letters. Because some children, even though they are, they are old enough to have been at school, haven't been at school. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we'll get sixth grade students that have never written anything because they haven't had the experience. Mm -hmm. And so they'll make squiggly lines to approximate letters, and anything that kind of looks like a letter that, you know, if they tell me what their story is, I will put a little check mark beside them to show them these are the ones that came closest. Mm -hmm. So always showing them where they're successful and always showing them where, um, where what they're trying to do fits in with the model that you're going for. Rather using the deficit model and saying, you know, you're not giving me any work, I can't read this and actually picking out what they are doing. Oh, that's right. so encouraging. You're meeting them every single time, wherever they are. So I think so many times do this. Um, it's talking about in-flight changes during conversation that relates to students' comments. Um, so, so in so many lessons, teachers you know, say, oh, that's good, and then they completely move on. And the child doesn't get any <laughs> validation of whether they're what answer, was good. <laughs> right or good or <laughs> yeah, whatever yeah, that was even important or relating to it. Yeah. Or if the child goes completely off topic, the teacher's going, no, that's not the answer. And then, but there's always something you can pull from a child's yeah. answer. There always is. To help them make a connection. Mm -hmm. Always. Right. Or you could ask the class, okay, try to relate this back to it. And then it's getting the other students to, you know, pay attention and try to make a connection rather than saying, oh, that answer is good, bad, or just completely ignoring it. And, and whenever you're planning your lessons, um, I guess a recommendation that I would make is overlearn how to be supportive. Mm -hmm. Um, so that it becomes so automatic that you don't even think about it anymore. That it's just so automatic that if you're asking them to write a sentence, you tell them all the steps to writing a sentence while they're doing it. And it's just you're, you're giving them, um, a lot of teachers think think aloud is just talk about stuff as you're doing it, and that's not true. Think aloud is telling them the decisions they have to make to perform that the way you need it. Mm -hmm. That's think aloud. Everything else just messes up your lesson. Mm -hmm. So you want to really be careful about what decisions do I have to make to accomplish that? So if I'm giving a, a, a student a decision to write a sentence, I have to say, now a sentence tells who did what. Mm -hmm. So if my sentence is, um, the grandfather walked home, who, the grandfather, did what, walked home. It starts with a capital, it ends with a period, write the sentence. So I just told them all the decisions that go into making that sentence. That's think aloud. Mm -hmm. And that's what ESL students really, really need. Mm -hmm because they can't use their own language to figure out, does it, does it sound right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I can say a sentence to a child that has been speaking English for seven years, and they know if it sounds right. Like if their mom would say something like that to them, they've got it, they can write that. But ESL students can't. Mm -hmm. they, they don't have that seven years of experience that someone else comes with. Um, another thing to think about is how many different ways of learning can I work into a lesson? We always want three ways of remembering. That's our minimum for every lesson. Um, so if I remember by drawing it, if I remember by acting it out, if I remember by repeating it, if I remember by writing it, if I remember by hearing it, if I remember by speaking it, if I remember by reading it, I want three in every lesson wow. of something. That's really good. Everything I teach has to have three connections. And what that does is it wires it into your schema in three places. So every time we put something into our brains, we put it in based on how it's similar to something else. Mm -hmm. I just gave them three places that that's similar. Mm -hmm. So the structure is in there in three different ways. Right, if I only put it in one way, oh, good luck getting it out. Because yeah, that's kind of hard to access. Um, if it's inadvertently teaching to different levels of the, or different types of intelligences, mm -hmm. and it's just been effective pedagogy to help children be able to go, okay, she said it like this, and that sort of clicked, 
But then she had me do this, and that I really Then I acted it. it out, and now I really get it. Yeah. yeah. If and a kid's very, um, doesn't have necessarily the language foundation in their L2 to get the reading or to understand what they're speaking, and then you go and you draw a picture, then it really solidifies and makes it a concrete knowledge. Exactly. Um, and anything I can get the child to do is better than having me do. Exactly. So if I can get the child to draw the picture, that's better than me drawing a picture. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If I can get the child to speak it, it's better than me speaking it. Mm -hmm. So it, the person who does the action does the learning. Because then they're so whoever's on. acting is learning. Mm -hmm. And if I'm the one acting, I'm learning and they're not. Because mm -hmm. that's just lecturing again. They're like, I don't understand. Yeah. And with the three, um, things, three ways of three remembering, ways of remembering, then it's accommodating more individuals than just general class. That is so mm -hmm. cool.